Okay. Well, I think we're going to start the lecture. Thanks everyone for coming back. Uh, there's been a number of questions about uh, a certificate to prove that you took this course. Um, I had underestimated how popular this would be uh, in terms of this wanting a certificate. We will find a mechanism for doing this uh, via an online form, I think. Uh, so wait until the end of the eight weeks and we will send you information about how to get a certificate showing that you completed the course. Uh, of course, you may absolutely put this on your CV. If you attended the course, I see no reason why you couldn't put it on your CV. Um, okay, so uh, I'm the first lecturer, of course, in, among many, and so I wanted to take uh, the introductory time, the first half of my lecture, uh, to talk about um, some general topics in biophysics, some general ideas of length scale and forces and things, because uh, I think you're going to see these several times uh, throughout um, uh, the summer school. And so, um, you know, it, it's helpful to sort of get your head around these things. I am, of course, a physicist. Uh, my name is Josh Shavitz. I'm a professor of physics uh, in the Genomics Institute at Princeton University. Uh, some people asked about the background image. Uh, this is actually a fruiting body of Myxococcus xanthus, which we'll be getting to uh, towards the end of the uh, uh, lecture today. Okay, so I want to start out by talking about, uh, in general, the length scales and size scales in biology. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about the macroscopic length scales. You can all see those with your naked eye. The dog runs past, you know how big a dog is, you know how big a fish is and a frog, uh, things like that. But I think what we, we, we sometimes fail to appreciate uh, are the size scales of the smaller things, the things you can't see uh, with your eye. Oftentimes people talk about how thin a human hair is in referencing some small object. Uh, human hair is, is not that thin actually, it's 100 microns or so. Um, but uh, as you go even smaller, you get to some incredibly uh, interesting and small length scales really approaching the atomic and the molecular scales. So I like this graphic here um, because it has some physics-y things in the bottom that maybe some of you have thought more about uh, in comparison to the biological things. Uh, cells tend to be on the scale of microns to tens of microns. Uh, your cells are on the larger end of that by and large. The bacteria that we'll be talking about today and we talked about a little bit this morning are on the smaller end of that, although some bacteria can actually grow, grow very, very long, and then they're, of course, very long. And inside of these is the instructional uh, manual for building the cell itself. This, of course, is the DNA, the chromosome or chromosomes uh, of the organism. And in fact, it, in most, uh, for most organisms, if you took that DNA and just stuck it in a vat of water, it would take up a space that's actually vastly larger than the cell itself. And so one of the more interesting problems in biology and biophysics right now is how you package up that enormous amount of DNA into something that fits inside the cell and can be read by the things that are gonna then build the new cells. Okay, so the DNA itself has the scale of tens of microns, uh, let's say. The individual letters, the bases of the DNA, the A, G, C, T, that maybe you learned about in school, those are actually separated by three angstroms, a third of a nanometer. So 0.3 times 10 to the minus nine meters. And so there's many, many bases inside these big chromosomes. They have to be squished up and packaged in all sorts of different ways. Okay, of particular interest right now are viruses, of course, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, viruses tend to be much smaller uh, than cells, although some viruses are quite large. Um, there are very big differences between viruses and bacteria. Uh, some people asked that question earlier uh, uh, this morning. I encourage you to go look some of this stuff up. A quick Google search will sort of inform you of what the major differences are. Now, inside of the cells, which are essentially uh, small packages, uh, uh, these organisms are packages of machines, are the machines themselves. These are going to be proteins and complexes of proteins, single molecules or many molecules jumped up together. And they really are machines in the sense that they are mechanical. They uh, uh, stretch and pull and glue 
objects together to form chemical bonds. And these have the size scale on uh, the nanometer scale or so, uh, several nanometers up to maybe 10 uh, nanometers. Uh, an atom, of course, a hydrogen atom, you all know the Bohr radius uh, is a little less uh, um, than an angstrom. And so you have uh, the molecular scale being only, let's say, an order of magnitude less than the protein scale. There aren't that many atoms inside of some of these uh, molecules, and yet they are built to be freely uh, uh, functioning machines. Okay, so Deanna talked a bit about microscopy. It's true, microscopy is the workhorse of a lot of biophysical uh, experiments. There are other uh, kinds of experiments, of course. There's DNA sequencing. You can do a lot with DNA sequencing. Uh, today I want to talk a bit about imaging. And just as Di Deanna said, a microscope really is just a lens. It's just like a magnifying glass. A magnifying glass uh, uh, counts as a microscope as much as anything else. And it takes uh, an object here, if that object is emitting light or scattering light, I can put a lens and I can make an image of that scattered light somewhere else. In this kind of very old fashioned microscope, there's actually gonna be three lenses involved in making this image. There's what's called the objective lens, the one in the front of the tube. There's the eyepiece lens, which is another lens. And those act in conjunction with the lens in your eye to form an image on your retina. And so you're making an image of whatever it is on this little plate of glass, let's say, onto your retina. Your retina is essentially a little camera. Your brain reads out the camera and that's what you see as an image. So um, that would be called wide field microscopy. This is a microscopy where you're taking the light distribution at an object and you're using it to form an image somewhere. There's another kind of microscopy that we won't talk in specific detail about. And that's where I shine a point of light at an object and then I image how much light scatters or comes from that point by whatever modality I'm doing onto a single pixel detector. And then I move the point around over my object and I record how much light that is and I build up an image that way. And that's called a scanning, uh, point scanning or scanning microscopy. So if I'm using a microscope like this here, or this sort of brass thing, um, I'm maybe shining light through a sample. Most biological specimens, like if you put a bunch of bacteria uh, in media on a piece of glass, the bacteria have almost the same exact index of refraction of, as the water around them. They're basically all water. And so you won't see anything. And so you need a way of what's called enhancing the contrast. And you can use the phase of the light. There's other different kinds of techniques that you can use to sort of enhance this big picture. And of course, if you want to look at really small things, as Ben was saying earlier uh, on today, you can use electrons, which uh, are of course waves, as we learned in quantum mechanics, in addition to particles. And you can use them as waves for imaging. You don't lens them with little pieces of glass. That doesn't work very well. You lens them with magnetic fields. You create a beam of moving electrons. And of course, you learned uh, in electricity and magnetism that uh, uh, moving charged particles through a magnetic field uh, will be bent uh, through QV cross B. And so you can use that to essentially lens. So if you make images the way we just described, you see everything. And often that isn't very useful. Uh, and so what you'd rather like to do is see specific things, the specific kind of molecule I'm interested, the one that does this action. I'd like to see where it is or how it moves around. And in order to do that, uh, you have to label it specifically so you see that thing and not all the other things. And the way this is done is you do this mostly with fluorescence. So fluorescence is a quantum mechanical technique you shine in photons of one energy, let's say this green wavelength here. They then excite transitions from a ground state to an excited state. There's a small relaxation to the lowest of the excited states. There's often multiple molecular energy states. And then you get de-excitation, and that releases a photon. But because of this relaxation and the spectrum of the ground state energy levels, the photon that comes out will be a lower energy than the photon that went in, which means it's a longer wavelength so if you have a molecule that excites in the green, it will emit in the red. And so I shine in a bunch of green light and I design a camera that only sees red light. I put a red film in front of it, a filter, let's say. And by doing that, I only see the molecules and the light that comes from the specific thing that has my fluorescent molecule on it. And 
you can now uh, attach fluorescent molecules to your molecules of interest chemically. You can also convince uh, um, an organism to put fluorescent molecules on its proteins itself by genetically changing the DNA of that organism and borrowing a piece of DNA from like a jellyfish, which usually makes a green glowing protein, you then stick that on the end of the protein you're interested in, and the organism all by itself will make you your molecule of interest glowing in that color. And so by doing that, um, you can look at only the molecules you're interested in. Uh, you can do lots of colors at once. You could have one that glows in blue and one in green and one in red and one in a far red and look at them all differently by separating them what we would call spectrally or by color, by using different color filters or different color excitation lasers, lasers for example. Uh, you can also do this in 3D. Deanna talked about this a little bit. I'm not going to get into that, but all of these techniques can be done in 2 or 3D conventionally. Okay, so you may have heard that there's a resolution limit to microscopy. You can't see things infinitely small, and this is true. Uh, diffraction limits the resolution of a microscope, and if you remember back to when you first learned optics, you learned that if I have a plane wave incident on an aperture, after you learned about two-slit diffraction, you said, well, what if the slit itself was wide? And you said, okay, I can use Huygens' principle to assume that there's little point sources everywhere on the wavefront. If I put a whole bunch of point sources inside of this uh, slit, they will all interfere in the far field and make a diffraction pattern. And that diffraction pattern of a circle, of an open circle, is called an airy disk. It basically looks like a Gaussian in the middle with some rings around it. And the size of that Gaussian is about the wavelength of light divided by two. You can get it down to maybe divided by three, but not much less than that. Okay, and as Deanna said, this is related to how much of the light you can collect from these molecules. And so this will limit the resolution in the sense that if I had a very, very small object, when I look at it with this wavelength of light, it looks like a big blurry object, the size of which is lambda over two, no matter how big that object actually is, as long as it's small. This is true in microscopy. This is true in uh, SLR conventional cameras. You may know if you go to very high f-stop, your image quality degrades, and that's because of diffraction. This is true in astronomy when you're talking about imaging uh, the stars as well. So there are several techniques called super resolution techniques. I won't talk about any specifically in my lecture, but if you're interested in them, you should look these up. These are ways of getting around the resolution by using nonlinearities in space and time of the fluorescence signal uh, to build up an image, an array of numbers, that has effectively a higher resolution uh, than whatever. Um, the, if you're using conventional uh, visible light, your wavelength is something like 500 nanometers, so your diffraction limit, the size, smallest thing you can see is maybe 200 nanometers, maybe a little smaller. So it's smaller than a bacterium. We will be able to see inside of bacteria, but not too much more, uh, too much smaller. Okay, so microscopy can use for more than just pretty pictures. Uh, you can put two of these fluorescent molecules near each other, and they will exchange energy uh, such that the fluorescence you get from one of them depends on how close it is to the other one, and it's actually a very steep function that falls off in a couple nanometers. So in some sense, you can make a sort of nanometer scale ruler by looking at the dipole-dipole interactions of these fluorophores, and you can use that for various kinds of measurements. You can use light to cut things. If you use a pulsed laser at the right frequency, you can absorb so much energy in a structure inside the cell that you can cut it. You can also design fluorescent proteins in cells that either allow you to use light to control the neural activation of a nerve cell, so you can turn on a neuron or turn off a neuron, or you can have a different kind of protein that reads out the activity of that neuron. So you can actually look at what the neural signals are. And you'll see, I think, both of these later uh, in the school when we get to talking about neuroscience. Okay, so that, that was about measuring uh, pictures or measuring positions of things. What about measuring mechanics when we talk about uh, um, biological molecules? And there's a number of different ways to do this. You can use magnetic forces. Literally, you can take a magnet, it could be an electromagnet, it could be a a uh, rare earth magnet with a very strong field, for example. And if you put a small particle that is either ferromagnetic or paramagnetic near there, it will feel magnetic forces. 
And if you're smart enough to figure out how to link that particle to a molecule you might care about, maybe DNA or a protein that moves on DNA, you can use the magnetic field to apply forces. You can use what's called an atomic force microscope. This is perhaps the easiest to understand. This is basically a small stick. And you make it small through fabrication, but it's a little stick. And you run that stick into things, and it bends when it runs into things. And you know that it costs energy to bend a beam. And so that's what the, 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 the atomic force microscope is really about, measuring that deflection. Okay. Um, you can use fluid flow to uh, apply a force or measure a force that a molecule is producing. If you know the drag coefficient, let's say, of this sphere here, and I'm flowing fluid past it, I know what the force on that sphere is. It's F equals the drag coefficient times the fluid velocity. And so then I know equivalently that that force is being applied to this molecule here. And I could read out how much force is being applied to that molecule. There's another uh, technique called traction force microscopy. This is if I have a cell or a group of cells that's going to be moving on a surface. And I'd like to ask how much stress is being generated in the surface. Well, what I can do is I can look at how the surface is deformed. And I put little tracer particles, they're probably fluorescent, and I look at an image of this deformable substrate. And as the cell is squishing the substrate, I measure how much the substrate is squished. I then have a difficult inverse problem to solve uh, about, well, if I see this much squishing, how much stress is that? But you can solve that using Green's functions techniques, similar to things that you might have learned about uh, and electricity and magnetism, and you can solve for the, the stresses that the cell was applying. So you may have noticed all of these things are basically Hooke's law. I have an object, and I know how much, uh, I know what the elasticity or the compliance of that object is. I attach that object to my molecule of interest. I look at how much it extends, and I apply F equals minus Kx. It really is as simple as the thing you learned in probably the very first day of mechanics. Uh, uh, when you first took freshman two. Now, there's one more kind of spring that I want to talk a little bit more about just because I like it a lot. It's called an optical trap. And an optical trap is produced if I focus a laser beam very tightly in one region in space, objects close to that region in space will be sucked into the middle of that laser beam as if they were in a tractor beam, because uh, you basically make a spring made of light. And the easiest way to understand this if I imagine I have two optical rays coming into this lens, one and two, and they're being focused to this point F. Now I take a dielectric sphere, glass, plastic, whatever you want, and I put it not centered at F, but centered a little bit to the right of F. And if I do that, these rays will do refraction using Snell's law, same thing you learned in freshman physics. And if you notice, in the beginning, the total momentum of the light was pointed downwards. This arrow is down, this ray is down. Now I have ray B going mostly down and ray A going far off to the right. So in fact, those two rays have been essentially tilted to point to the right. And because light has momentum, the bead applied a force to that light to in the rightward direction. And therefore, because of Newton's laws, the light applies an equal and opposite force to the bead, which would be in the left direction, which pushes it back towards the focus F. So I have essentially a linear spring. My object moves back and forth, and it gets pulled back into it. So here I want to show you a couple movies for fun. This first one is of swimming E. coli. And I'm going to turn a laser beam onto one of them right about now. And you can see that that guy is trapped. And then I move the laser beam. And of course, the E. coli comes with me wherever I go inside my laser beam. If I make many laser beams, I can make a series of optical traps. So here I have, I think, uh, six by eight, something like that. And you can make the world's smallest game of Tetris by moving these traps around. This is not scientifically of interest, but it's pretty fun. OK, so I want to pause now. I have a few of these pauses in to read the questions to see if there's anything uh, we can take care of here.
Uh, if you add fluorescent proteins, uh, uh, fluorescent trackers to a protein, it can definitely disturb their functionality. A lot of what we do practically in the lab is proving to ourselves and others that we didn't destroy that functionality. And that just is a matter of hooking them on in different ways and seeing what works. I think this question is, answer, is asking, uh, why is it fair to study bacteria in the lab rather than natural the natural habitat? And that's a very fair question. Um, you can try to do some of what we're discussing in the wild. People have microscopes you can put in the deep ocean to look at bacterial motility. Um, oftentimes, what you try to do is uh, make the best connections you can between what's happening in the lab and what ha might happen in the natural environment. What would it look like if you tried to observe something a bit smaller than the wavelength? It would just be blurry. Instead of being a sharp thing, so you imagine you look at the picture and you squint your eyes and it looks blurry, that's basically what it would uh, look like. Okay, I'm gonna move on. All right, so let's talk a bit about bacteria. And since we're all physicists, uh, sort of, I, I want you to imagine the following thing. I want you to think a bit like an engineer, an engineering physicist, and I want you to design for me a submarine that's two microns in length and one micron in size. You can think a little bit, okay, I know a little bit about MEMS technologies and maybe I can, okay, great. Now, inside of this submarine, I would like you to put sensors for light and different kinds of chemical concentrations, many different chemical kinds of chemicals, okay? And now once you've done that, I want you to build a computer inside of that submarine, that computer is going to read in these light signals and these chemical signals and make decisions about where to go and how to live and whether there are friends around. I want you to equip this submarine with little torpedoes, little spikes that can poke out and puncture other enemy submarines. I want you to make other kinds of spikes that can connect to friendly submarines and exchange good things with them and get good things from those submarines, okay? This sounds like a preposterous notion. Now we gotta go one step further. Not only have you built the submarines to do these things, I want you to make this submarine have all the tools and all the instructions for making more submarines and all the materials. This submarine, every 20 minutes, is going to become two submarines. This is what a bacterium does, and it is truly astounding as a machine. So I, just let that sink in as you go to sleep tonight. If I said anything interesting, this one should just astound you. If you've not thought about what these tiny objects can do, it's time to think about it because it is really amazing. So just to give you some general facts about bacteria, there are microns in size, up to tens of microns. They come in a variety of shapes. Uh, they, they grow by um, growing and then splitting in half, or more than half. Uh, this can take as fast as maybe 10 minutes, but many species are very, very slow, many hours, let's say. Uh, they eat sugars and other molecules via absorption, so their job is to get to where the stuff is they want to eat. Uh, many of them, but not all, can move around and they can use this movement to find food. Uh, different species of bacteria can basically grow anywhere in the planet under any kind of environment that might exist here, different pHs, different temperatures, et cetera. Some of them are truly single-celled. They live by themselves, do their own thing. Others uh, live in large groups sometimes, and some live in groups all the time. They basically are not successful in the wild as individuals. They only live in groups, okay? And many of them are super important to our, our bodies. We wouldn't be alive without them, except there are others that will kill us, obviously. In fact, one fun fact is that there are more bacterial cells in and on your body than your own human cells. They're much smaller, of course, but there are more of them. Okay, so we talked a little bit about moving this movement this morning. I won't go into this. I think Endow did a good job uh, describing uh, the low Reynolds number concepts. Indeed, uh, you write F equals MA for a small bit of fluid. That looks like this. Here you have the direct pressure gradients. Here you have viscous drag. 
This is the acceleration of that bit of fluid. And this is the acceleration you get that's like a hose. If I have a hose that's putting water out and I squeeze my thumb on it, the water comes out faster. And that's what this term is in the equation. And so at low Reynolds number, I get to ignore these terms. And of course, I get what's called Stokes flow. Now, here's an interesting story. So here's a physical three-link swimmer. This is done by Pekko Hosoi at MIT. And uh, they built it. It lives in some highly viscous thing, glycerol or something. And so you can see that it indeed swims by putting its things like this. And so Purcell had dreamed up this scallop, this scallop theorem that said if you only had one degree of freedom, at low Reynolds number, you couldn't swim. If you closed and opened, you would just go one, two, one, two, and nothing would ever happen. And he said, that's not how a scallop swims. A scallop squeezes and it uses inertia to pull itself like that. So it goes zoom, zoom, like that. And this was all fine and good until he got a letter after he published this paper uh, from a biologist that said, you know, I have lots of scallops and in fact, you're absolutely completely backwards. What happens is the scallops swim mouth first. What they really do is they encapsulate a bunch of fluid inside the shell. They use the muscle in the shell to squirt out two jets in the back of the scallop. And so it swims like this, which is the exact opposite of what Purcell had thought. Still wouldn't work at low Reynolds number, but still an interesting uh, turn of events. Okay, so there's different kinds of bacterial motility. There are flagellar motility. This is the kind of thing that Purcell was talking about. Uh, here on the top, you can see E. coli. They have multiple external helical propellers called flagella on the back. They turn them. That produces a non-reciprocal repeated motion that propels them uh, forwards. On the bottom, you have a bacterium called rhodospirellum that has only a singular flagella, but this, of course, works, works too. There's another way of moving, which essentially uses the whole body to do the undulating propagating wave. On the top, you have a spirochete called leptospira. Spirochetes cause many diseases, syphilis, Lyme disease. Uh, and this organism is helical, but it has an internal flagella. And what that flagellum does is it produces a traveling helical wave along the cell body itself. That wave then propels the cell forwards. On the bottom, you have an organism called spiroplasma. Spiroplasma is a helical bacterium that unwinds itself over and over from left-handed to right-handed to left-handed helices. And if you ever had an old-fashioned phone that had a cord, I'm not sure if any of you are old enough for this, but if you did, you know that where a right-handed and a left-handed piece of the cord met, you had a kink in the structure and you could propagate that kink. And so literally, this organism is doing the wave as it travels. So these are bacteria that swim in fluids. You can also have bacteria uh, that move on surfaces, and there's two general ways this happens. One is via the extrusion of essentially grappling hook lines, a polymer called a pilus. That polymer binds to the outside of the cell, and then the cell retracts it and pulls itself along. So here you can see on the top, you get these polymers that are extruded and then come back. In the bottom, you see a cell. It sends the polymer out. The polymer binds, and it pulls it back through the action of the retraction of that. There's another mechanism that cells can move, and this is via essentially little feet protein that walk from the head to the tail. These feet stick to the surface underneath them, and they propel the cell forwards like this. Uh, the feet are also on the top of the cell, so if you put a small bead on top of the cell, you can see the bead will be moved from the head to the tail as the feet drag it along. Gonna skip that one. All right, let's see what we have in the questions at this point. Uh, light in general does not uh, uh, destroy membranes. The maximum size cell can be trapped in an optical trap. Uh, something like the wavelength of light, give or take, would be the size scale. Uh, you can maybe you can go up more than that. Really, what's happening is you're getting effective force generation when you have a difference in the index of refraction between the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell. So actually, you can optically trap very large things. The problem is they only feel a lot of force when they have an edge that encounters the focus of the light. So if I have a focus of the light right here in a big object, it's kind of free to move like this, but when it hits the edge, it won't be able to move any further. So it kind of does this. So in that sense, it's trapped, but just not as strongly trapped in that sense. Uh, okay. 
And fluorescent is smaller than the reason you use optical wavelengths. Optical wavelengths um, tend to be good for a lot of reasons. They don't damage the cells very much. Much of biology is opaque to optical wavelengths. Uh, not all of it, much of it, stuff like that. So that tends to be uh, why, why it's used. Um, for resolution reasons, you could think about going to smaller wavelengths. Those wavelengths tend to absorb much more by biomolecules and cause significant uh, kinds of damage to the cells. OK, I think I'm going to uh, go on here. If we have time at the end, we can come back to some of these, these questions. OK, so that's the end of what I wanted to say about kind of general techniques of things. I now want to focus on um, one organism itself, Myxococcus xanthus, and the patterns that it can form uh, via motion. But before we do this, I want to introduce some general concepts uh, from physics, or, or at least have, have you start to think about what uh, might be different in living systems than what you might have learned already. So if you've only taken freshman physics, you probably haven't seen what I'm going to talk about now. But if you've taken uh, thermodynamics or statistical mechanics, either in a chemistry or a physics concept, you know that the general idea, Boltzmann's big idea, is that microscopic states are all equally likely. And if I have a very big system, many atoms, you know, Avogadro's number of things, then if you look at the probability of any particular macroscopic state, you're really only going to see one macroscopic state. That's kind of the unique state. It's the one that has the maximum number of microscopic configurations, the one that maximizes entropy is, is one way to say that. Okay, and the way you would calculate something is you find all the different possibilities for different energetic microstates, you find the density of states, you integrate them by this factor, which is uh, the exponential of that energy divided by kT, that gives you this partition function, you can then find the free energy from the log of the partition function, and you might imagine minimizing the free energy to define the equilibrium state. And really what this is doing is that equilibrium state is a balance between thermal energy and entropy, the thing that's trying uh, to bring you to this maximum, uh, uh, maximally likely mic set of microscopic states. And that is then balanced by all the internal and external energies, either from electric uh, external fields and magnetic field, gravity, something like that, or from interactions between the, 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 the components of your system. They like to be close to each other. They don't like to be close to each other. They like to align with each other, whatever those energies are. And that's the balance there. When we talk about living systems and active systems, um, it's different than just saying you're out of equilibrium. I can make lots of things out of equilibrium. I could take this glass of water and smash it on the floor, and it would, for a little bit, be quite out of equilibrium as it's in the process of smashing and all the bombs are breaking and things like that. And that's not what we mean when we say life is out of equilibrium. What we really mean is that life, living systems, are very far from equilibrium in a long-lived steady state, right? Like your steady state is 100 years, give or take, whatever. There's some development, but that's kind of the idea, okay? And so this is more than just a transition between equilibrium states. You're using energy input to drive you away from equilibrium and stay in that region of phase space for a very long time. Okay, so here what we have is a balance of internal driving, uh, the release of chemical energy from eating all the glucose and burning ATPs and all that stuff, and the motions that are being created and all the other uh, chemistry that's happening inside of your cells, inside of your body. And that's what's balancing any external fields and other interactions, uh, physical interactions that are happening. And so there's a long-lived balance that happens, and it can be very dynamic, um, but that's what a living system really is. When you hit equilibrium, you die. That seems pretty good. Okay, so the hero of the rest of the story is going to be this single-celled organism called Myxococcus xanthus. It's a bacterium. It doesn't swim. It doesn't have any flagella. Uh, you'll hear a lot about E. coli uh, swimming in a couple of weeks when uh, Professor Dada talks to you. Um, but here we're talking about a, a moving bacteria that moves on surfaces. And in fact, it never lives like this on its own. It actually can't, because what it does is it eats other bacteria, but it needs to be in a large collection of its friends in order to eat the other bacteria. Otherwise, it won't be successful in this sort of hunting process. So in fact, you wouldn't see this in the wild. This is much more like what you like, might see. 
Not really, this is on a Petri dish, but this is the idea. On the left side here, I have a colony of Myxococcus xanthus on this Petri dish. There's many, many cells here, many millions or tens of millions, I actually don't know. This is a macroscopic thing. It's a centimeter or at least a few millimeters on a sign. On the right side, I have a colony of E. coli. Now, this is a dryish Petri dish. There's not a lot of water around. So the E. coli can't actually really move. They can't swim. And e. coli don't know how to crawl on surfaces. But Mixo do, and what Mixo would like to do is eat the E. coli. So you see here that Myxococcus is going to start spreading and crawling. It will crawl on top of the E. coli and is actually going to eat all these E. coli. You may see some interesting rippling or wave-like patterns here that helps the Myxococcus myth mix on top of the E. coli, and they're killing all the E. coli over here. Now over here on the left, you saw something different. These cells weren't lucky enough to make it out to the E. coli. They saw they were having no food and they said, well, we had better protect ourselves from uh, starving to death. And the way they do that is they uh, form a droplet called a fruiting body on the surface that has many, many cells, hundreds of thousands of cells. All the cells decide collectively to come and form a group a little drop that you can see with your naked eye, the little orange blobs, and inside of there they form little uh, protective spores, and you won't have to worry about how that works. Okay, so they initially went from essentially a group of cells on the surface, what you might call wetted the surface, and then they did a phase transition called de-wetting, where they left the surface and formed droplets, just like water doesn't like to wet your, uh, your raincoat, or your windshield, or a piece of glass if you've coated it, or a, a waxy surface. If you try to shove a bunch of water on there and you let it go, it will de-wet and form droplets. You'll also notice that these cells on the right now, they ate all the E. coli, and then later they said, oh, there's no more food. So they also form these little droplets. And what we're gonna be talking about for the rest of the time here is the physical process via which these individual cells in a group of 100,000 figure out how to form a droplet. Now you might imagine, okay, that's fine. Uh, one of them sticks a flag in the ground and says, this is where the droplet is, everybody come over here. They all look around, they find the flag, and they move towards uh, the flag. Now the problem with that is the cells can't see very far and they don't have flagpoles and that sort of a thing. They really can only say see, quote unquote, by touching things next to them. And so that's really not how it works. It's gonna work much more like the way water will de-wet off of a waxy leaf, as we'll see in a second. Okay, so the first thing we notice about Myxococcus is it was a long elongated thing. And that long elongated thing is gonna be in this large group. When uh, lots of little long elongated things get together, they like to line up with each other. Why? Well, if I just sort of squish a bunch of matchsticks or little toothpicks, Together, it's hard to make them randomly oriented, whereas if I align them together, I can get them more closely and tightly packed, okay? You may have learned in physics of another kind of uh, a material where there are uh, atoms or molecules that want to line up with each other, and those are called uh, ferromagnets, and we use the Ising model to think about that. We model the location of everywhere on this solid lattice is having a spin. Those spins both create and sense magnetic fields, and the magnetic fields want to align with each other. So if I have this is less favorable and this is more energetically favorable, and you can write down the energy function all over here, and we'll tell you for that. When you do that, we're gonna then have this trade-off we talked about in terms of equilibrium between uh, temperature and entropy, which are trying to randomize all the different spin directions, and the interaction energy, which is trying to make them all the same. And so if you've studied this process, you know that this will undergo a phase transition at the critical temperature where above that temperature, the spins will all be pointing in random directions and you won't really have a good way. And below that temperature, the spins will start to all point in the same direction in larger and larger fields in space, and you will have a permanent magnet. Now, active particles like our little cells will do something very similar, except they have a special property, which is that they move along their direction. 
Spins don't do that, but our cells do, as do birds, birds that are flying in the sky in a flock, as you know, they like to align with each other, and then they keep moving along that alignment direction. And so if you change the randomness in this system, you can go from rather unordered states into ordered states where you have domains where all the cells are pointing in the same way. And those cells are, of course, moving, so all the cells move together. And what you get is a flock. And in fact, this is exactly what you see in Mixococcus xanthus, is you get small groups of these individual cells that move together with all the same physical properties that you would have statistical properties of a bird flock. Now, if you make this an even more dense suspension or, or packing of the cells together, now you have an entire material where all the cells are trying to sort of align with each other because you're packing them in. And we know about materials where the molecules or the objects of those materials are elongated and therefore try to pack relative to orientation to each other. And these are called pneumatic liquid crystals. If you have a, a material that is made up of these linear, long elongated molecules, the interactions, the physical interactions between those molecules will cause them to want to line up and they can be in a pneumatic phase, they can be in what's called a smectic or stacked phase. This is how the liquid crystals in your watch or your display might work. Basically what happens is these different phases act differently on the polarization of light and so you can either make uh, a pixel opaque or not opaque by having it either in this pneumatic phase or this cholesteric phase, uh, for example, which would rotate the polarization. Okay, so, so what does this have to do with Mixococcus? Good question. Here's an image of a tightly packed group. This is the beginnings of fruiting body formation in Mixococcus. And what you see, hopefully you can see in the Zoom video, is that all the cells really are tightly packed and aligned with each other. So this really is a liquid crystal made of solid cells, except unlike the liquid crystal in your watch, this liquid crystal, all the molecules move along their alignment direction. And so it looks more like this. Okay, so you can see all the cells are moving. They, they stay tightly packed, but you see some very interesting things. You see these holes in the material open up and close. And in fact, you're starting to see here second layers of cells of this liquid crystal climbing on top of each other. Now, if you've thought about liquid crystal, or perhaps even just by looking at this movie, you see that while locally the cells are all uh, aligned with each other, that's not true in the whole screen. It's not like they're all aligned to the upper, you know, going upright or something like that. There's individual places in this movie where the alignment isn't perfect. And we know from the physics of liquid crystals that this can happen uh, in a number of different ways at individual points in the alignment field, and we can quantify what these different uh, uh, topological defects, uh, point defects, are by looking at how the orientation changes around that point. So here we have a point in space where there's no average orientation right around the middle. All of those arrows rotate by 180 degrees as I go around this circle, and it makes a three-fold symmetric object. Here, I have another point in space where there's no good orientation, no average orientation right at that point. Point. The arrows also turn by 180 degrees as I move in a circle around this point, but in the opposite direction. And this one looks more like a comet. And in fact, here you can see a beautiful example of this, uh, what we call a plus and a minus uh, defect pair in someone's thumbprint that I found on Google Imagery. And okay, so when I have um, the cells all aligned with each other exactly, if I try to unalign some of them, the easiest way to do that is to make a pair of these defects, just like this. I can take something that's totally alignment lined and I can sort of move these like this and I will get a plus defect and a minus defect. We can look for these uh, in, our, in our images by quantifying or measuring the local alignment, the direction of the cells everywhere in space. So here's that same image I showed you before, except now in color, I'm telling you which direction the cells are. So green is up left, blue is up, red is to the right, et cetera. You can watch uh, what this movie looks like. And what you'll see is that there'll be specific places in space where the color is very discontinuous. In fact, you have all the colors meeting at once. And that's the, the location of one of these defects. So here's a defect pair. Here we have a minus one half defect and a plus one half defect. 
and you can look at the location of these defects on the, the movie itself. And what you'll see if you look closely at this movie is that you get holes forming at the location of the blue threefold symmetric defects, these negative defects. And you have new layers, the dark structures forming, where you have a positive one half defect. This is because at the location of a negative defect, I have flows essentially pointing outwards from the middle of that point. And so that opens up the structure into a hole. If I have a plus one half defect, which looks like this, these cells are pushing against these cells and they tend to climb on top of them, so like this. And so when I do that, uh, I get new layers forming. I'm going to pause for questions now. Let me just see if we have uh, some common questions here. Ha! I like this comment. It's crazy because us biologists think of this as normal, but putting it into a physicist's perspective, it makes you realize how amazing biology can be. I couldn't agree more uh, with this question. Let me see. Ah, if there are bacteria that can only survive in a group, why are they considered multicellular? That's an interesting question. Uh, to me, the difference would be one of these can survive by itself if you give it all the right food. So in the lab, I can take an individual myxococcus, put it on a plate full of food, and it will survive just fine. What it can't do is it can't compete and hunt out in the wild without being a group. You know, it's sort of, I mean, there are animals that are the same way, right? Like where an individual would not be able to hunt the way the group can. And I still think you would call those a single, uh, a single organism. Just reading some more of these here. All right, maybe we'll move on. Uh, and try to finish up if we can. Uh, we have access to all the Q&A questions. They get saved from the webinar. And so we are going to try to sort of go through some of them and, and maybe write out over email some more specific answers to things uh, that seem more, more common. OK. So we just discussed sort of the physical mechanism via which the, the droplets form. So I, I, I build up these layers by having these kinds of cells run into these oriented cells and they start climbing on top of each other. Now, how do you know when this is favorable and when it's not? In traditional uh, uh, thermodynamics, if you learned about this, or if you learned about, let's say, the mixing, you know, I'm gonna make a solution where I try to mix oil and water, or lipids and water, and I would like to have, know how I can make an admixture of those. Uh, you typically make a phase diagram where you have temperature on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, you could have, say, less concentration of your uh, solute and the solvent. Or if you're thinking about de-wetting of droplets, it's really the thickness of the liquid layer on top of the solid layer. And you'll get different parts of your phase diagram where either you'd have wetted layers here on the left, or at constant temperature, if I made it thicker, I would have the coexistence between some wetted regions and some droplet regions. Or if I made it even more fluid, I would de-wet all of the, the, the fluid off of the surface. And at some critical temperature, that doesn't happen anymore, uh, et cetera. OK, so what can we do when we think about myxococcus? Well, as we said before, temperature is not the thing that's driving the fluctuations here, that's trying to produce the randomness. And so if we want to make a phase diagram like this, we don't want to put temperature here. But I'll show you what we're going to put there in a second. OK, so let's see if these concepts make sense. Here I have a very low thickness population of myxococcus on a solid su substrate, and you probably can't actually see anything in the Zoom movie. The cells are moving around, they form a few little layers, they don't do very much, and they certainly don't form big droplets. So this you might think of as a gas or fully wetted uh, kind of dilute gas uh, phase or liquid phase on the solid substrate. If you make the, fi the film thickness thicker, you put more myxococcus on the sur surface, and then let you let it go. What you see is that there are droplets that are nucleated on the surface in different places the whole time. Okay, so you'll see, you know, there's one here, this one came and grew, now there's one over here, and this one grow, and then they grow and they grow and they grow and they grow and they grow. Okay, so the, the, the droplets have to nucleate, which is exactly what you would see 
in traditional films. Or if you think about crystal nucleation, this is like the formation of a critical nucleus before you can get uh, the crystal to grow. If you make it even thicker though, something totally different happens. As soon as you start the experiment, droplets form everywhere all at the same time and all sort of have roughly the same size scale. Okay, it's a completely different kinetic regime. And in fact, this is exactly what you see in passive chemical systems. So it seems like the idea of a phase diagram would be the right one, but you still don't know what to put for temperature. Okay, I could change the actual temperature. Let me just be clear. It's not that temperature does nothing. If I uh, don't, you know, if I freeze my mixococcus, they don't move around. That's very clear. But that's not, at constant temperature, that's not what's governing the dynamics of the cells. What's governing the dynamics of the cells is the motility, is their ability to crawl around on the surface and on each other. And we can describe how essentially random that motility is. Is it completely in one direction or is it in a very wiggly path using a dimensionless number called the Peckley number? So we already saw the Reynolds number. That was a dimensionless number that compared inertial forces to viscous forces, as you learned. Here we have something called the Peckley number, which is going to compare diffusive dynamics to what would be called transport or advective dynamics. And the easiest uh, way to think about this, the way you usually learn this, is you imagine, let's say I have a river and it's very still, and I put some dye molecules into it and I watch them and they diffuse out. So I can describe the dynamics of the molecules through diffusion. Now imagine I have a river that's flowing really, really fast, and I squirt my dye molecules into it. Well, I mean, they're still going to diffuse out a bit, but if you think about how far they move over time, the flow is dragging them very, very far compared to how fast they're spreading out by a diffusion. And so that would be the opposite regime for the Peckley number. And a Peckley number about one means that the diffusive dynamics and the effective dynamics are similar. So it will turn out, and you can prove this in theory, we don't have time obviously to go into this here, that the Peckley number is the appropriate number for thinking the temperature-like number for thinking about the dynamics uh, of these active sort of liquid crystal systems and other active systems. So I can make a phase diagram where I have the cell density on the x-axis and this sort of temperature-like Peckley number on the y-axis. And what you see is that there's this spinodal line where inside of this regime of the phase diagram, where I have the red squares, that's where you get droplets to form. And outside of that, where I have the black circles, you don't get droplets. That's a wetted phase. So here you have a wetted phase, and here you have the coexistence of a wetted and a dewetted phase. And when you ask, what does mixococcus do when you starve it, when it runs out of food, well, what it does is it changes its Peckley number by going faster and um, sort of moving in a straighter paths. And that lowers the Peckley number so that it starts out in the wetted phase, drops below the spinodal line, and then the whole population de-wets into droplets off the surface. So let's try to think about what this means. This is like your water molecules in your cup spontaneously deciding themselves to freeze by slowing down. Okay? If all of your water molecules decided that instead of moving around at whatever speed they move now because of KT, they would all move very, very slowly, then your, your glass would be filled with ice. right? And the water molecules would have done that themselves. This, of course, is not something that water molecules can do. Cells, on the other hand, can do exactly that. They can decide, A, they could decide to stop moving, which is not what they did here. They decided to actually move faster, because when you move faster, you sort of increase the kinds of collisions that are going to uh, uh, make these defects form more layers and pull you off the surface into a de-wetted regime. Importantly, they don't have to talk to each other outside of mechanics. They don't have to stick a flagpole and have everyone else talk to the one guy with the flagpole and figure out where it is. They don't have to do anything besides themselves deciding if they're starving or not. And if they are, execute this change to the way they move. And if enough of their friends do that all at the same time, the whole thing will de-wet into little droplets off of the surface. And to me, that's something that I find very beautiful
that evolution found this uh, answer uh, to, a to a physical problem. How can I form a group of protective groups of cells by using active matter physics and not fancy chemistry and signaling and things like this? Okay. So this on the upper right here in the very corner is an example of a Mixococcus fruiting body. This is actually a more complicated uh, species than what we just looked at. The ones that we just looked at look like little orange mounds. In fact, Mixococcus anthus lives almost everywhere in the earth and you've probably seen these little orange mounds and thought they were a fungus. But in fact, they were a mixobacterium. All of these patterns that you see in this slide are formed by living organisms through development or some other kinds of growth. And they all involve these kinds of uh, physical instabilities. Some of them also involve, involve uh, a way of building patterns with chemistry called the Turing pattern or reaction diffusion. And the combination of these kinds of mechanisms is what gives rise to all the structure essentially and the diversity and the shapes and the patterns that we see uh, in the world of living organisms today. So I think that's the end of what I prepared. Let me look through the questions and we can spend a little more time answering the questions. I thank you uh, all for coming. This is a tremendous experiment for us and it's been a lot of fun, but let's see what we have here um, in the questions. Are there other successful ways we can see things smaller than wavelengths or wavelengths as small as possible too as you can use detect or measure objects? Um, it depends what you mean by C. If you would like to make what we would call an image, uh, a lot of times you use waves, but it's not true. So you can use an atomic force microscope, this little stick that we talked about for applying forces. You can use it to make a topographical image. You can put a very small tip on the end of it, and you can use it to touch other objects. So I could go like this. I could say, oh, that, that's, that's not very deep. And then I was like, oh, now I'm hitting this glass, and now I'm going down. I'm hitting other things. And I can make a map of the height of everything. And the spatial resolution of that can be extremely high. In fact, you may have seen STM images, which instead of touching, measure tongue length from it. You may have seen STM images that can show you the position of individual atoms in a lattice. And maybe you've seen the electronic wave function for the quantum corral, things like this. So those are, those are images. And you could use similar uh, techniques to do things um, uh, uh, on uh, living samples. Okay, are there any similarities between these techniques and Rosalind Franklin's technique to take pictures of DNA? So uh, what Rosalind Franklin and others did is, is something in, in structural biology called x-ray crystallography. It's a diffraction technique. The idea is that um, rather than making an actual image, you put in plane waves into an object and you measure the far field diffraction pattern and you try to do an inverse uh, a Fourier or inverse um, uh, sort of diffraction or Fourier transform onto that to measure the structure that the molecule must have had. Now, a single molecule is not very good for this because it's very small and doesn't interact very much with light. So typically you make a crystal. So you take identical copies of the molecule, DNA or whatever it is, you array them in a periodic array, you make a diffraction pattern from that, and that combines the diffraction pattern from the array you made with the structure of the molecule itself, and then you do this inverse Fourier transform. And that's essentially how crystal, uh, structural biology has been done for a very, very long time. There are other techniques you can use. You can use NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. Um, nowadays, a lot of people are moving in the direction of cryo-electron tomography and microscopy. And so this is similar, except you're using electron waves on individual particles. We don't have time to get um, but that's how Rosalind Franklin uh, and others have done their sorts of experiments. Can you think of gliding as a military uh, tank's chain rolling? Uh, not exactly. The feet are kind of independent of each other. They're not necessarily uh, uh, hooked to a coherent, uh, stiff track of what's going on, so not really. Okay, I just described scanning probe a second ago. So those of you who had questions about scanning probes. Uh, 
Okay. Now, now there's now there's many many questions. All right. I think I'm going to read these uh, tonight. Uh, if there's lots of common questions, I'll probably compose an email and send it to the whole group. Um, again, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we will reconvene next Monday at uh, uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, I think this has been very successful. So uh, thank you very much. It's been wonderful. Uh, well, not seeing with you, but uh, talking to you and interacting with you through the question and answer. Okay, thank you very much.